Welcome to the lecture on science and cooking. Uh, tonight we're very, very fortunate to have the author of Modernist Cuisine visiting us. Um, as always with these uh, lectures, we need to acknowledge our sponsors. Uh, Jose Andresen's Think Food Group, uh, Whole Foods on River Street who supply all the lab supplies because we eat our labs. Uh, Alicia Zartoli, uh, Taza, Specialty Foods Boston and Oya have all contributed to these uh, lectures. So tonight we'll hear from Nathan Mirwald, um, but let me remind you that next week David Chang and Carlos Tejedor are talking, and uh, the following week is Farhan Adria. Um, you have to get tickets for him. He's the only person. Their tickets are free, but you need tickets for that lecture. So. We have, I, I really shouldn't talk about science when Nathan is talking, because he knows much more about science, as I'll prove to you uh, in this little introduction. But I thought we should have a little bit, you know, the, the tradition is we have a little bit of science as a warm up act. Um, and this week, what more could we do but talk about turkey? Uh, you might, at the end of this uh, talk, think that I'm a turkey. Uh, <laughs> but how long should we cook the turkey? We're going to cook turkeys on Thursday. How long should we cook it? Well, of course, we just look it up, right? We look up cooking times. But did you ever wonder where those cooking times came from? Well, of course, if you want to understand it, you have to realize that if this is the turkey, the heat is coming from the oven, it's flowing inwards, it's coming in, and we need to somehow calculate how long it takes to cook the turkey. So. Well, we have to look for an equation. <laughs> oh. This is the wrong equation. I'll prove it to you that's the wrong equation. This is something I learned from Nathan. This is to remind you all about what equations could be like if we all were like Nathan. But really, this is the wrong equation. This is a closer equation. Remember, heat diffuses, and this is a time that takes that tells us how it depends on a length and a distance. But this is the actual equation of the week, so now you can really clap. <laughs> this, is a re this is a review. We've talked about this equation before. This tells us how long to cook the turkey. It depends on how, what temperature we want to cook the turkey to. It depends on the temperature that you start with and the temperature that is your, your, the oven is heated up to, and also on this diffusion coefficient. This diffusion coefficient uh, is how heat diffuses through food. And so we can look that up, and here's a list of measured diffusion uh, constants. This is uh, on a book of a practical guide to sous vide cooking. And Nathan has also studied a lot about sous vide cooking, has made measurements of this sort. But notice that the diffusion coefficients really don't vary by very much. In fact, they're all very close to water, and that's perhaps not so, so, so surprising because food most foods are predominantly water. And in fact, if we were just to use the diffusion coefficient for water and calculate the times for uh, cooking uh, a turkey, we would get a good value. But, you know, look at the turkey. We need to have something. Remember, I showed you how we calculated it. We need some distance. So, how do we do that? Well, I'm a physicist, so everything. Is just a sphere. <laughs> so we approximate a turkey by a sphere. And so what we do is we take the mass of the turkey and we calculate its mass. We, we assume the density is basically that of water. And from that I can get a calculated size. And then I can put that in the equation. And I can calculate the times. And look, the times really are in very, these are the calculated times. The times are in very good agreement with what the uh, recipe guidelines tell you for different weights of turkey. Notice, however, it says that you start with a certain temperature, you warm it up, you heat to this temperature, but then look what it says, the temperature will continue to rise as the turkey stands. 
And the reason is that you have a difference. You have a gradient of heat. It's hottest on the outside. It's coolest on the inside. And even if you take it out of the oven, it has to come to some uniform temperature. So the heat from the outside of the turkey will still continue to cook the inside of the turkey. That's the nature of the diffusion of heat through the turkey. So really, Nathan Mervald, our speaker tonight, started out even at a different level of a physicist than me. He started out really writing equations like this, but he's moved on to much, uh, uh, much different things. Uh, now he, uh, uh, not only he was at Microsoft for a while, he has a company called Intellectual Ventures, but he also uh, does modernist cuisine. These are some of the uh, things of uh, uh, sous vide cooking charts that we can find some of the things that he's studied, really bringing science to cooking. And he's wa written this really marvelous book, which maybe he'll tell us a little bit about, a little bit about tonight. So let me now introduce you to Nathan Mirwell. <laughs> So I'm going to talk a bit about modernist cuisine, the movement, uh, a bit about my first book, and then also some about my most recent book, Modernist Cuisine at Home, which is trying to take that modernist revolution to home cooking. So this was uh, the, uh, the book that, uh, that David was talking about here, Modernist Cuisine, uh, five hardcover volumes plus one softcover volume. Uh, and that was aimed at being an uh, encyclopedic treatment of modern cooking techniques. That came out long, long ago in 2011. Um, it took five years to do. Uh, we, as a follow-up to that, we decided let's, we would try to make a book that was really about home cooking. Because a lot of the things that were in this book, although they were fascinating, and I, I totally recommend the book, even to people at home, a lot of it wasn't about how can I cook at home. It was more about explaining the science of cooking or explaining uh, the most esoteric cooking techniques. Uh, so we came out with this. This is a modernist um, treatment of home cooking. It's 450-some uh, pages plus a 228 pages. So it's a slim, pamphlet-like 600 pages, almost 700. Uh, back when I first decided to write modernist cuisine, I thought it was going to be huge. And I thought huge meant 600 pages. And now 600 pages in my little home book. <clears throat> And like modernist cuisine, it's about uh, using photography and uh, as clear a text as we could write to explain how things work. Uh, we cut things in half. There's a Viking stove we cut in half. Um, fortunately, Viking donated that to us because um, they don't work so good after you cut them in half, particularly the gas part just doesn't work so good. It, uh, like modernist cuisine, it comes with a washable kitchen manual. Because if you're going to cook with it, it's going to get dirty. The main book is, is sort of too pretty to take in the kitchen or to get, to, to get dirty. This one here, you can splatter stuff on and it washes right off. Uh, one of the things that's really big to us uh, is uh, trying to make a book that its physical quality matches uh, the quality of the food. You know, if you went to a fine restaurant and they served you with paper plates and plastic knives and forks, eh, the food would be the same but something would be missing from the experience. So we thought it was important to have a physical aspect to the book that was good. So it's big, it's got great paper, it's got great ink. Um, this shows really what a nerd I am. I'm gonna tell you about how the, the images were reproduced. Um, this is standard halftone uh, screening, 175 lines. And it looks like that if you blow it up. A good art book will go to 200 lines. But it still has this rectilinear grid. It's sort of a holdover from the past. Where literally, you made these by putting a screen on top of the, uh, uh, the plate. Uh, we use something called stochastic uh, screening. And stochastic screening just looks a whole lot better. Um, now, that's a technology you could only do if you have digital printing technology. But hey, we do. Um, uh, we had a big focus on uh, uh, photos in the book because I thought it was important to show people what food looks like. And well, people say, God, what camera did you use? So your pictures are so vibrant. So it's not the camera, it's the ink. It turns out you can't represent every color with arbitrary set of inks. So here's a picture, and where it's gray is a color that ordinary printing inks cannot reproduce. Here's the full picture. 
You can see it happens mostly in highly saturated colors. Look at the tomato, look at the orange, uh, even that chartreuse green of the um, cauliflower. You can't get those colors unless you buy the fancy ink. So, ah, what the hell, let's, let's buy the fancy ink. Um, one question I get asked a lot is, how come in the 21st century we're talking about ink and paper at all? Why not put this all online or make it digital? And uh, there's two reasons. The historical reason is when we started laying out the book and doing what was going to be the final layout, which was several years back, there was no iPad. The only digital reading device was a Kindle, and when you took this page, you put it on Kindle, it's not so cool looking, particularly in black and white. Um, these days, you could do better with an iPad or the various other tablets, but it's still really small. Um, and so someday we'll have a digital uh, version, but in the short term, not, because we set the whole thing up for really big, really high resolution, beautiful photos that are really hard to navigate. If you just take a PDF version and try it on a, a uh, tablet, which we've done, it's, it's not very usable. So here's some fun facts about the new cookbook. Two volumes, 9.9 .9 pounds unpacked, 684 pages, 228 of which are waterproof, 23 chapters, 210,000 words, 405 recipes and variations, 114 step-by-step -step photos. We took 86,000 images and 1,500 photos are actually in the book, so a lot of photos. Here is a comparison. I'm kind of a nerd and kind of analytical, so this is how I compare the previous book with the new book. Uh, First book was 625, 442 recently on Amazon. Second book, much cheaper, 140. And it's been as actually as low as $91 uh, on Amazon. That it sort of fluctuates uh, randomly. Well, that was 41 cents per recipe. <laughs> but what would you pay? Wait, don't answer. It's 35 cents per recipe. <laughs> the first book is 1563 per pound. $14, but guess what? Parmesan cheese is $19 a pound. <laughs> so if you like Parmesan cheese, you should like this book. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, one of the big dilemmas uh, that we had uh, with the first book was what should we price it at? It was clearly really big. We had a lot invested in it. Uh, what was a good price? Um, I was talking to a reporter when we announced this new book, and they said, you know, it's so cheap. And then she stopped herself, she said, you know what you've done? You've made a $140 cookbook seem cheap. <laughs> so thank God I did it in this order. So suppose you put all the text in a single line in Microsoft Word. <laughs> now, I don't know why you would put all the text in a single line in Microsoft Word, but if you did, it would reach from here to MIT. Whereas, if you put all of the text from modern, the big book in line, you could go all the way to Logan Airport. <laughs> Again, I'm not sure quite what that has to do with the book or with the science of cooking, but, but we thought it was cool. So now I'm going to talk, and switch from talking about the books to talking about modernist cuisine, the movement. And here, uh, there's some ideas that are artistic and scientific. Uh, the first is that art is what we do when uh, art is the expression of human thought and emotion. Um, and it, art is something that's generally considered very different than science. But of course, they both live here in this physical world. Art and science are both important. Um, I, I had a reviewer uh, uh, from the UK ask me uh, about this in the first book. And, and she was not that happy with this whole concept. And she says, what made you think you should bring science into the kitchen? I said, sorry, science was already in the kitchen. I just was taking the ignorance out. <laughs> because it's true that science is about the laws of nature, and the laws of nature apply in the kitchen just as surely as they apply anywhere else in the universe. When you cook, you are using heat and chemical reactions and uh, also mechanical means to alter food in a way that makes it more tasty, more nutritious, uh, possibly even edible at all. And that transformation is about science. But what you choose to do is about art or about craft. It's, it, those are aesthetic things. 
So the, our first book subtitle was called The Art and Science of Cooking. I think that cooking really is an expressive art. But it's really hard to do, to do well at art if you don't know how things work. Um, if you don't understand what makes a building stand up, how are you going to do, do the art of architecture? Not very well. So I think that cooking really is an art, and that modernist cuisine, this, this moder the movement, uh, not the book, is about melding art and science. Uh, Fran Adria, who will be speaking later, Fran, to me, is an artist who creates a very expressive artistic uh, creation that assaults and influences your thoughts and emotions just as surely as a painting or a poem or a film or music does. But he does so with a knowledge of how that stuff works. So a, modernism is actually an old idea in art, and here's an example. This is a painting from 1857. It's called The Gleaners, Jean-Francois Millet, and it, was, it, it typified art in its period, an academic uh, phase in French art, French art, it was realistic. A few years later, Van Gogh paints this. Okay? Same topic, two people out in the field, totally different. Now, when this first came out, it was shocking to people. Um, in fact, here are two cartoons. This, uh, they're from Le Figaro in Paris in the 1870s, around this time. The first shows a pregnant woman who is, being, is going to go into an, expression, an impressionist exhibit. And the guard is saying, Madame, it's not safe for you to enter. Please back away. Because the impressionist art was so ugly, she would miscarry. <laughs> that is what a, a, a 19th century audience would have understood from this cartoon. The other cartoon shows um, a Turk. It says, Turks bought several impressionist can canvases to be used in case of war. These Impressionist paintings were so ugly, you could chase people off a battlefield by showing them. Now, the funny thing about that is that Impressionist art is today maybe the most popular kind of art in the world. If there is an uh, Impressionist show somewhere, you'll find the line is stretches around the block. People love it, but at the time, it was radically different. It challenged this aesthetic notion. And that isn't the only places. You know, here's a, a building here at Harvard, classical architecture. It's got these columns that actually date in architecture all the way back to the Greeks uh, and the Romans. This is what classical architecture is like, and that's what a, a, um, a building at a fine educational institution ought to look like. Except, down the street, there's a building that looks like this. Frank Gehry's Strata Center is about uh, modernist, or, or maybe even postmodernist architecture that says, no, we get to break rules. We get to make a building that looks higgly-piggly like it's all over the place. And you use that aesthetically to challenge people's ideas. A lot of the food that's called modernist does this at an aesthetic level. It changes your idea of what food is supposed to be. Now, Challenging people's ingrained ideas about food is a risky thing. It, it freaks some people out. Um, you probably would be better off trying to be controversial about, say, religion or politics than food with some people, because we've got such a, a, a grounding in it. Um, when Ferran first started putting foam on, uh, on things, huge reaction, which of course was why he was doing it, because part of art is about deliberately breaking rules to make us understand we had rules there to begin with. And so modernism, regardless of whether it's modernism in architecture uh, or in painting or in food, modernism is about breaks with tradition. It's about celebrating aesthetic values beyond simple realism. People sometimes ask me, does food have to be delicious? I say, well, what do you think of bitters? Or, or what do you think of tonic water? Or what do you think of habierno peppers? Of course, a lot of people love habierno peppers, but if you gave a habierno pepper, some of their super hot sauce, to somebody who had never experienced them, they'd think you poisoned them, right? And the same thing is true with bitter things. In fact, deliciousness is partially cultural, it's partially contextual, it's partially, partially personal. And I don't think food has to always be a conventional idea of delicious any more than every story has to have a happy ending. 
And another part of art and modernism is embracing new tools, new techniques, trying to explore what's possible. And that's, been, that's true of architecture and painting, and it's now true of, of this. So here's an example. Um, Italian food is one of the most tradition-oriented food, um, national foods. And there's many elements of, of classic uh, or contemporary Italian food, but I just picked three here, basil, tomatoes, and garlic. And it's really hard to imagine Italian food without basil, tomato, and garlic, right? Wrong. In fact, the ancient Romans didn't use all, any, any of those. Tomatoes were from the New World. They didn't have them. The most common condiment for the ancient Romans was something called liquamen. Liquamen is virtually identical to Thai fish sauce. It's made by taking anchovies or other fish. You seal them up in a jar. Um, and you put it in the sun for a month. <laughs> Just dandy stuff. Actually, it's delicious. Uh, and fish sauce actually, Roman fish sauce lives on in Western cooking through Worcestershire sauce, of all things, a, a, a traditional British thing that is the direct lineal descendant uh, of that. Uh, the most common herb was lovage for the Romans. They didn't have basil. They used tiny amounts of garlic extremely rarely. So no basil, no garlic, but massive amounts of uh, black pepper. So uh, if you had Roman cuisine, ancient Roman cuisine is essentially nothing like uh, current uh, Italian cuisine. Now, in between those two, there was actually medieval Italian cuisine. I don't have time to go through, through, go through all of that, but it too was totally different. And in fact, in the Middle Ages, the cuisine in Italy was virtually indistinguishable from the cu cuisine in uh, England, believe it or not. And the first known recipe for lasagna comes from the form of curry, which is the first cookbook ever written in English. Lasagna was an English invention, so far as we can tell. And the reason I bring this up is that cooking is all about change. It's all about evolution. Uh, Italy was the last part of Europe to accept tomatoes. And within Italy, the, the, the region of Italy that was the last to accept it was Tuscany. Yeah, it hurts your head to think that, but it's true. Um, Michael Pollan, a great food writer, I, I love his stuff, um, but I, I gotta call him out on this one thing. He has this, what he calls the great-grandmother rule. And you should not eat anything your great-grandma would not recognize as food. Well, my grandma was not big on sushi, okay? <laughs> my, my grandma grew up on a farm in Minnesota, not so much on raw fish or sushi, not so much on hummus either, okay? Those were completely alien, not even great grandma, my grandma would not recognize either one of those as food. But I wouldn't like to be in a world that didn't have those, but you know, we can keep going. My great grandma would not know what a hamburger is or a pizza. So although it sounds great to say, well, don't recognize anything your great-grandma uses as food, it's a, it's a natural reaction to the idea of industrialized, uh, low-quality food that's dished out. So I understand totally where he's coming from, but in fact, you'd throw out most of the best things we eat if you took this rule out. And you can keep going back and then you say, well, what if great-grandma followed the great-grandma rule? <laughs> well, no ice cream, uh, amusingly, no, no cured sausages. It turns out that there's, before the uh, mid part of the 18th century, there was no fermented sausages in Europe. So prasada, nada. <laughs> okay? You couldn't get that because that was, it was actually invented in China. Of course, if you keep going back, essentially everything moves back. The, the single biggest event in uh, cooking, in terms of, of a worldwide event, was when food from the New World uh, came back to the Old World. So corn and tomatoes and chocolate. Gigantic change caused by, by that importation of a set of foods from, from one continent to another that had been separated for, for a really long time. Here's another thing, actually, um, great grandma couldn't have. This is espresso beans being ground. Espresso was invented in 1900. And it was invented as fast food because guess what espresso means in Italian? 
We have a high-speed video camera that we just love, so I... <laughs> now, so what, kind, what does modernist food mean now? Well, it means trying to do things that are really different. Uh, we had a section on making uh, potato chips uh, in the first book. Now, a potato chip is actually a glass. A solid-state physicist would tell you a glass is a very specific thing. There's crystalline solids, and crystalline solids have crystals in them. But there's a funny state of matter called a glass, where the stuff may want to crystallize, but it doesn't quite, and it makes this, this very funny state of matter called glass. Well, starch can form a glass under certain circumstances, and when you fry a potato that was thinly sliced, the starch in there will make a nice, crisp glass. If you have a prawn cracker, which is a, a, a typical uh, Asian uh, cuisine thing, that's made from typically tapioca starch. That fries up and is super crisp, the same thing. So I got on this kick of saying, let's make a chip out of anything. And I hit on watermelon. Now watermelon is a very inauspicious thing to try to make a chip out of, unless you give it enough starch. So to make a watermelon chip, you say, well, hey, fruit and vegetables are filled with lots of vacuoles that have water in them. They, they're actually quite porous. So um, an apple is 50% air. Now, that sounds crazy, except there's this thing actually around this time of year, around Thanksgiving to um, Halloween, that is a traditional American thing called bobbing for apples. If it wasn't, it didn't have air in it, why would they float? Hmm? They float nicely because they're half air. So... If you then put them in a vacuum, you can, uh, you can rupture a bunch of the vacuole walls, and then you can infuse something else into it. So in this case, what we do is we take very thinly sliced uh, watermelon, we put it in a vacuum with a slurry of starch, and it sucks the starch right up into it. Then you fry it up, and you get very crispy watermelon chips. Now, you can keep playing this game other ways. We wanted to make the ultimate French fry. Uh, one of the themes we have is that any food, no matter how humble it may seem, any food is worthy of giving it your attention, and it's worthy of trying to get, make an ultimate version. And maybe you don't eat the ultimate version all the time, but there is a, such a thing as an ultimate uh, French fry. So in this case, what we did is we, uh, we steamed potatoes, then we put them in an ultrasonic bath, uh, so we use the, something called cavitation bubbles to do something very similar. It rips up the outside of the potato up and it infuses the starch in. So we take starch and we put more starch into the, the first fraction of a millimeter of the potato. It makes it really crispy when you fry it. And then they don't get soggy like for hours. Here's a cool thing. This is uh, something called the Le Leidenfrost effect. When uh, th this is liquid nitrogen, but it could equal, equally be uh, water. If you've ever seen water splattered on a really hot skillet, it bounces, and these little balls of water go everywhere because they seem to have no friction, because they have no friction. They actually float on a layer of gas. So I thought we'd do a demo. Now, for this demo, it's really important to have safety equipment, but I'm not going to use it. <laughs> this is liquid nitrogen. Now. I like to compare liquid nitrogen to uh, fry oil. Uh, oil in a deep fryer is typically about 325 degrees above zero Fahrenheit. This is 321 degrees below zero. So it's as cold as, um, at least in the Fahrenheit scale, it's as cold as it's hot. So I'm going to pour some in here. Now, Liquid nitrogen is wonderful stuff. We would just not cook without it anymore. The, um, there's a service that delivers it in our area, and when, when he, the guy delivers it to the house, he says, you know, there aren't any other houses on my route. <laughs> um, the first interesting thing is that nitrogen is 78% of the air around us, so this is just something that's already here. But here's how we can show this. This light. Now, so here is a flame, and as we move it towards here, it goes out. It goes out because there's cold nitrogen gas that's in here. So now it's, it's, we, it's boiling, because of course, when you heat a water, you heat any liquid, 
above its boiling point, it boils. Very good. So this is 321 degrees below zero. It's very dangerous, so don't ever do this. <laughs> now, when people say, isn't liquid nitrogen dangerous, I would say, try this with fry oil. <laughs> now, there's lots of fun things you can do with liquid nitrogen. Um, we use it for a couple of things in the kitchen. First of all, it lets you make things intensely cold. Second of all, it makes you make things that are cold. Oh, there's a little uh, Leidenfrost effect, that, the, the, uh, the stuff that we saw earlier. You see how those little, the, those uh, tiny little balls just go shooting out? They're all floating on a layer of gas. That's also why I can do this. Notice I don't leave it in there for very long. <laughs> um, I'm never touching the nitrogen liquid nitrogen. What happens is I put my, see now it's calming down, it's got a very cold layer of nitrogen gas in here, but gas has very little heat transfer coefficient, it's not very dense. So when I put this in, a layer of nitrogen gas is forming all around my fingers, and it'll stay that way for a while. And while it stays that way, hey, my fingers don't actually freeze. So here's a cool thing, this is a balloon I blew up. So we're going to put the balloon in here, we'll let it sit. Now, what's happening here is, a, is the universal gas law. PV equals nRT. So as we cool the balloon, the air inside shrinks. In fact, the nitrogen wants to get this. Now watch it expand. As a substitute for food, I'm going to use a rose. So we'll put this in here for a, for a moment. Liquid nitrogen is a great example of something which has been uh, around for a very long time, uh, late 19th century is when it was first produced. The first suggestion of using it for cooking occurs in 1901. A woman named Mrs. Beaton, or no, excuse me, Mrs. Marshall, Mrs. Agnes Marshall, was sort of the Martha Stewart of the 19th century. She had a cooking school, she wrote cookbooks, she was very famous. So she writes this book where she's got a passage that she'd seen a demonstration of this, which at the time was called liquid air. She said, oh, wouldn't it be great if you could use it for cooking and you could make ice cream at the table? She was totally right. But the first person to take that up and do it was actually a traditional French chef in 1979 uh, in southwest France. Okay, well, I'm going to show you why we use it in cooking. If you use it, you can make things a little bit cold, like I did with my fingers, but you can also make it really, really cold, so you can go like that. So this is like glass. In fact, you can hear me crunch it here. It, it is literally like glass because it's, fr it's frozen so, 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 so cold. So now we'll go back here. I've got a couple videos. So we use it for lots of things. Here's uh, cryo poaching, um, uh, cryo shattering. We have a whole cryo almost everything. Um, for example, uh, to make a powder out of something, there's a parsley there. You freeze it in liquid nitrogen, put it in a uh, food processor. It'll shatter into a powder, um, kind of like the rose did. Uh, you can freeze uh, olive oil or other oils, and uh, you do this. The cool thing, you freeze a big pile of it, you hit it with a hammer, and it looks like glass shards. You put it on the plate, then it melts when it comes out. Uh, if you want to make little spheres, you put a droplet, and you let it fall in. And it, if you have, depending on the viscosity, it, there's a certain distance it's got to fall for it to form a nice sphere, and then it hits the uh, liquid nitrogen, and it freezes. Um, here's another thing you can do with it. I'd like to say there's a real cooking purpose to this, but... You know, it, it's one of the unfortunate side effects of having a high-speed camera is pretty soon almost everything you need to do this to. <laughs> now watch this closely. Now we're talking about a different aspect of boiling. Watch it and I'll tell you what it is in a moment. That's popcorn. Now, when a liquid boils into a vapor, it expands. Uh, in the case, I'll do this one more time here, because that one was... Watch closely. So 
there's water in there. The water's boiling to steam. And right now, it's a tiny steam rocket. A fissure is formed, and there's steam shooting out. And you can watch it expand to try to leave the pressure, but ultimately, it fails. In fact, when you boil water to steam, it expands in volume by about a factor of 1,600. Um, that's uh, how prawn crackers puff up. That's how a, largely how a souffle rises. Uh, that's how chicharron or um, uh, uh, pork, fried pork rinds uh, get to be puffy. It's all because this uh, effect when you uh, boil water to steam. Well, there's tons of other things. I'm just going to hit on a few of them. Um, grilling is a fascinating deal. It turns out that most of the uh, science of grilling, most of the flavor of grilling, comes from this. This is fat dropping down onto a hot coil, coal and it flares up. And that flare up produces most of the characteristic flavor of charbroiling. Um, people say, oh, we should use mes mesquite charcoal. It doesn't matter. What matters is that the fat drips on the coals. Um, this, is, uh, this is sort of a close up. The, to, for those burgers to taste like they are grilled, you've got to have the fat from below. If you put the fat, ab or excuse me, the, the fat has to drip onto heat be um, that's below. If you put the heat above, then you get broiled burgers, those are good, but they taste different. And the difference is incomplete combustion and paralysis of that uh, stuff. So people sometimes wonder why their grilled zucchini doesn't taste that great. There's no fat in a zucchini. <laughs> so our solution is simple. Get a squirt bottle, fill it full of oil, and squirt it on there. It works like a charm. So that's what this says. So it's not about the, the charcoal. The charcoal has essentially no flavor. Didn't matter what it was made of originally, you made it into a charcoal, which means there's nothing left. Um, so it's all of the things, uh, various sugars and other things contribute also to that thing, but the single biggest uh, aspect is fat um, going. So that's how you get the complex flavors. Uh, another interesting thing is proteins and how proteins coagulate under heat. This is uh, eggs where the eggs are at different temperatures. Of course, there's a raw egg over there. As you increase the temperature, both the yolk and the uh, egg white have different proteins. And they coagulate at different temperatures. And so a lot of egg cookery is about how you deal with that fact, that you've got very different temperatures for the two. Um, what most people like is to have a yolk that's soft and runny, at least for, there's a bunch of dishes. We want a soft, runny yolk, but you want to have a firm white. Unfortunately, it goes the wrong way around. The yolk gets hard first, which is why there's a bunch of techniques that you can do to try to make sure your yolk isn't fully uh, hot or isn't too hot before you heat the outside. But once we, oh, here's another gratuitous high-speed video. <laughs> so this is frying an egg. Now, do you see those bubbles forming? Those bubbles are steam. That's the same expansion uh, factor. As it, uh, as it gets hot, a, 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 a bubble of steam nucleates, and it grows, and that's what makes all those bubbles. That's what the sizzle is from. So when we uh, started doing this work on the temperature of eggs, we realized that custards really had a lot of science in them. Now, a custard is when you take um, uh, milk or cream or some other liquid, and you mix either whole egg uh, or egg white or egg yolk in with it. Well, depending on how much egg you add, that will clearly affect the texture, but also depending on how much temperature you apply to it, it'll affect the temperature. So we did hundreds of experiments to say what are the different combinations of concentration and temperature to get you a certain effect. Now, I call this modernist by attitude. There's nothing modern about this. Escoffier could have done this, right? All it requires is um, a thermometer. So it's a very simple thing, but if you have an attitude of being scientific, you have an attitude of using empiricism, then absolutely you'd say, yeah, let's go do this. So we did it, and this is a great reference for anybody trying to make a custard. And if you, depending on, on what else you're doing, you might choose to use a different temperature or a different concentration of egg. So modernism doesn't depend on fancy ingredients or equipment, although I love those things. It depends on uh, stuff like this. And so this is one form of a, 
of a custard. This is a creme anglaise put onto berries. But here's another one. This is our striped omelet. Uh, we make omelets in the oven. The reason you make them in an oven is that you can control the temperature and therefore the texture much better than you can in a pan. And if you understand that custard table, you can get the perfect texture every time. And then once we started making them in the oven, I said, hey, we can make them striped. <laughs> and that's totally gratuitous once again. But uh, when I went to chef school in France many years ago, we learned how to make a, a cake called biscuit joconde, uh, which is a striped cake. You take two different colors of uh, cake batter. Uh, well, hey, if we can make an omelet, let's make a striped omelet. So this is a striped omelet. This one here, the nice black stripes, means I use black truffle. More often we use um, uh, mushroom. But we could also use tomato and other things. There's another thing. Here's scrambled egg foam. And this is certainly served in a way that you wouldn't find in a typical Denny's if you went in the cer and asked for scam scrambled eggs. It's a way of taking scrambled eggs and trying to put them in a context where they're not obvious they're scrambled eggs. Okay, here's another gratuitous video. <laughs> you know, you have a high-speed camera, you got some eggs. Pretty soon someone says, you know, my cousin has a gun. <laughs> They say if you want to make an omelet, you've got to break a few eggs. That's a pretty dramatic way to ma make them. Here's another interesting story. This is a uh, chapter now from the, uh, the new cookbook. We had one recipe like this in the uh, first book. We expanded into a whole chapter. And this is soups inspired by pretzels. Now, that sounds strange. But you know how a pretzel is really brown on the outside? It's brown because to, when you make pretzels, you dip them in an alkali solution lye and water or uh, baking soda and water. Because in an alkaline environment, the browning reactions, uh, caramelization, mostly Maillard reaction, happens at lower temperature. So when you cook those pretzels, you bake them, in fact, they get really dark. So I was reading that, I thought, I wonder what else it works for. So we started making caramelized carrot soup, and then we kind of got carried away. Um, that's sort of a theme with us. Uh, we said, let's use a pressure cooker, and if we can, if we add uh, the baking soda, maybe we can get the carrots to caramelize in a pressure cooker. Um, and in fact, they will work. So inside a pressure cooker, it's higher pressure than out here. That means that you can uh, make water 250 degrees before it boils. Um, and you have 100% relative humidity, that, that's sort of important. Then if I lower the pH, I can actually brown the things inside that. And in fact, you can brown all the way through. Um, and so here's, here's an example. It makes an amazing carrot soup. And then we said, hey, let's try it with broccoli. Let's try it with this. Then we started rendering fat with it. If you render fat uh, with a little bit of baking soda uh, in a pressure cooker, it gets this amazing roast uh, flavor to it. So it's a great example of using a couple of simple principles, one discovered long ago by whoever invented pretzels, um, and then sort of explaining, using it in a broader context. There's the soup. Here's a whole bunch of variations to the soup. Artichokes, cauliflower, broccoli gruyere, corn, apple parsnip, mushroom. It all works. They, they get different colors. They get different deg degrees of roasted or browning uh, flavors. So roast chicken is another thing we devoted a chapter to in the new book. Uh, <clears throat> roast chicken is fundamentally a contradiction in terms. You want to have the breast meat in particular be juicy, and it's very easy to dry it out. But you like the skin to be crispy. But those are at odds. This, to get the skin crispy, you have to get it really hot, but it's touching the breast. So what do you do? So along with our philosophy of saying, hey, any dish can be elevated, and there's, there's sort of an ultimate expression of it, we said, let's make the ultimate roast chicken. Uh, well, in order to do that, you need chickens that are junkies. <laughs> so there's a whole bunch of steps to this. One step is you stick your fingers under the skin, and you push the skin away. Um, that's done in a, a traditional Chinese cooking for Peking duck. Well, brining is a terrific method for, uh, for making a, uh, a pro any kind of a, a meat protein more juicy. Uh, salt, the salt ions alter the proteins and they make them hold more water. Very straightforward. There's a problem. The skin is full of protein too. And juicy skin is called rubbery skin. 
So although it works great to brine a whole bird, the skin gets horrible. So we said, no, no, enough of that. So we take our brine and we inject it into the meat. And we're careful not to get any of it on the skin. You can buy these syringes in any um, uh, kitchen store. So it's actually not that hard to do. Uh, we also then hang the bird. Oh, here's in injection brining. Um, this explains what I just said. We hang the bird like this um, uh, in the uh, refrigerator for a couple days. Now, the reason you do that is twofold. One is there's a whole religion about um, trussing chickens. Now, you have to truss the chicken, and I, I can't quite do it here, fortunately, but you, you bring the legs up and you're, you're all in a little ball. It's totally the wrong thing to do. You want the legs to get more heat, not less heat. And by bunching them up, it's harder for the heat to penetrate because of the diffusion things that uh, they've uh, started this with. Uh, the other thing is if you hang it in your kitchen uncovered, the skin dries out. But you want the skin to dry out if you want it to be crispy. Then you bake it for four and a half hours at low temperature, then you put it in a hot oven, and ultimately it looks like this. Um, now, in a modernist context, you could also say, well, why don't I just pull the skin off, cook it separately, and put it back on? We do that too. It's much easier. Um, but we thought it was cool to try to make the traditional roast chicken as a whole bird. And that's what it looks like. When we serve this at our tasting menus, we like to say that it's grandma's roast chicken, so we serve it on grandma's plates. Um, for the sauce, we also do another thing that's interesting. Uh, most uh, sauces in French cuisine are finished with butter or cream. That tastes wonderful. The trouble is, it tastes like butter and cream. If you're making a chicken uh, sauce, wouldn't you like it to taste like chicken? So we always uh, thicken our sauces with rendered fat from the same thing. So in this case, we take rendered chicken fat, uh, which in Jewish cooking is called schmaltz. So we take our schmaltz and we thicken with that. Um, then we, if we're really being fancy, we pressure render it so we get this wonderful roast flavor. Um, one of the differences between modernist cuisine at home and, and the big book is that the um, modernist cuisine at home has simpler recipes in terms of the technology, simpler ingredients, but also a different style of food. Uh, in our big book, we cover all kinds of cuisine, including uh, recipes from Heston Blumenthal and Ferran Adria, Jose Andres, many of, almost everybody, I think, in your, um, uh, in your whole uh, program here. Uh, but people don't eat that kind of food every day. So in modernist cuisine at home, we said, let's try a less formal kind of food. So we have a whole chapter on mac and cheese. Now, the key thing with mac and cheese is that cheese is an emulsion. Okay? Milk is an emulsion to begin with, and when you coagulate it, it's still an emulsion. It's just sort of a frozen emulsion. When you melt it, the fat separates. And you've probably had a pizza that has like a thin la uh, layer, maybe not so thin layer of oil on top, and the cheese gets really kind of gritty and stringy underneath. Well, you don't want that. So typically when you make a cheese sauce, you put in starch, cornstarch, flour, or something like that, to make a, what in French cooking called a bechamel sauce. The trouble is the starch gets in the way of the flavor of the cheese. So you get a starchy, gooey kind of sauce, not a cheesy kind of sauce. Um, well, it turns out in 1911, a man named James Kraft, who at the time was a small uh, cheese merchant in Chicago, Illinois, he owned one uh, horse and he had a wagon and he took his cheese around. The trouble is no one had a fridge so the cheese would often spoil. He says, how can I make canned cheese? Well, to make canned cheese, you had to, to make cheese that was heat stable. He found out how to do it, got a patent. That led to the Kraft Food Empire in Velveeta. You know, sometimes things go amiss. Um, <laughs> it turns out if you add a small amount of an emulsifying salt, it changes the balance of ions and it actually stabilizes the emulsion. So that's what we do. Here's, uh, here's the cheese. Here's what happens. It stays perfectly gooey and melty, and there's almost nothing in it except a tiny amount of the emulsifying salt. Typically, we use sodium citrate. Sodium citrate is in every grocery store in America, or just about, uh, because it's used in Passover. It's called sour salt. Uh, you can also order it on the internet and so forth. Well, then once you've got a melty cheese recipe, you use it all over the place. So we have a chapter on grilled cheese sandwiches. 
And then, of course, grilled cheese sandwiches are pretty plain, so we started putting other stuff in them. And then, melted cheese sandwiches, other stuff isn't so cool, so we suspended gravity to take these photographs. <laughs> uh, steak is another uh, great topic. Um, we, so I'm just going to flip through some of these because we don't have time to go through all of them. Uh, we have a great uh, uh, recipe for uh, picnic, cooking steaks on a picnic or a tailgate party. Um, you just put hot water in a big cooler and put the steaks in Ziploc bags and throw it in. A few hours later, you're, it's done. So you can, you can go, rather than having a cooler, you're actually using it as a heater. It's a sous vide without the equipment. Um, we have a, a bunch of recipes for carnitas, uh, for braised short ribs. If this doesn't make you hungry, you're a vegan. <laughs> and in fact, even if it does make, if you, even if you are a vegan, it may make you hungry. Um, chicken wings. It's another example of having less formal food. We have a whole chapter on chicken wings, but then we got carried away and we have sort of any kind of food on a stick. So sauté and skune and shish kebab, and this is our food on a stick chapter. Um, but that didn't sound so good for a chapter name, so we called it chicken wings. We, we love talking about ingredients. Uh, a question I get asked a lot is, isn't modernist cooking the total antithesis of farm to table? Say, no! Anybody who's a cook who really cares about the food wants great ingredients, and we do too. Uh, so uh, we, when we cook dinners ourselves, uh, we work with local farmers. We try to get the freshest ingredients possible. Uh, ingredients are really where it all starts. But ingredients aren't just the ingredients you traditionally use. So we have a section of this chapter called Walk on the Wild Side, where we say, regardless of what ethnicity you are, regardless of what your cooking tradition is, Go in those other aisles, or go to that part of town where those people that are different than you live, and shop in some of their things. Go to a West African market, go to a uh, Mexican market, or an Asian market. Uh, there's fruits and vegetables and all kinds of cool ingredients, and you owe it to yourself to explore them. We have a big chapter on eggs, uh, on salads and cold soups. So. Uh, one question I get asked is, uh, how do you get a photograph of uh, raspberries plunking into this raspberry soup, it's a cold soup, so perfectly? And the answer is you start with about five pounds of raspberries, <laughs> and you drop them two at a time, <laughs> and you take the picture. And you know, out of a couple pounds of raspberries, you'll get one that looks like this. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that uh, we made a mess, so you don't have to. <laughs> um, these, 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 these pictures take a lot of effort to do. Here's our uh, chapter on salmon. Uh, we're in the Northwest, so there's a lot of salmon there. We have a chapter on corn. Uh, corn is maybe one of the most interesting single uh, grains in the world. Uh, it probably feeds more people than any other grain, feeds more animals than any other grain. Um, and I, I like to say it's the first example of genetic engineering. It's one of the enormous cultural achievements of the New World is that people probably in uh, northern Mexico, but no one's absolutely sure, took a grass called teosinte, which is a pathetic little grass. It's only about this tall. It's only got a couple little seeds. And through lots of selective breeding, they turned it into this, which feeds the whole world. Now, it's one thing to say, hey, uh, those of us in this room probably eat foods from all over the world. It turns out the poorest people on earth also eat non-traditional foods. The biggest staple uh, grain in Africa is corn from, uh, uh, from the Americas. The second biggest staple in Africa, cassava. That's from Brazil. Um, custards and pies. Uh, in our big book, we don't do much in the way of uh, um, pastry baking or dessert, but we decided we had to do it for the home book, so we have a chapter on custards and pies. Um, here's our cooking lab, and uh, one of the things I wanted to, to tell you a little bit about is what we've done in between books. Uh, after we finished our first book, we had this whole team, we had this big lab, what are you gonna do with it? So we hit on this idea of cooking for people. Because cooking is intrinsically about sharing. Uh, you cook so someone else eats it. And almost anyone who loves to cook loves to see somebody eat that food. Well, for five years making the book, we cooked mostly for ourselves and the camera. We hadn't cooked for other people. 
so we started doing uh, uh, tasting menu dinners. And here's the menu. There's no choice. You get all of this. And you may think, that's really a lot, but this is page one. <laughs> I'm not kidding, it keeps going. Um, typically, we do 30 to 35 courses. Um, now, Fran Audrey has served me over 50 courses once, so I haven't quite gotten up to that level. And the idea here is to show people a whole range of different kinds of cooking, uh, different ways in which modernism is involved. Some of these are incredibly intensely modernist. And they look like Klingon food or, or what that might be. They, they don't look like they're, it's food for, from planet Earth, and it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be unusual. Uh, the, the last thing we do is something called gummy sweets. Um, those are uh, worms. Now, they're not made out of worms, but I found this cool place on the internet that sells molds for fishermen to make their own worm lures. Uh, God damn, we got to cook with this. <laughs> um, and of course, it's perfectly set up to use a gel. So we make these um, uh, usually olive oil and uh, vanilla or a variety of other flavors. So we make gels. But we make people eat worms at the end. So here's a time lapse uh, video that we did of, of one of these dinners. Uh, it's kind of a big production. Um, we understand why restaurants don't set up all from scratch every day. Uh, and it, it takes about three to four hours for people to eat the 35 courses. The thing that's been interesting about this is that unlike the book, we had direct feedback. Um, people love it, sometimes they don't love it. Um, I also got a lot of insight about working, I'd worked in restaurants before, but I'd never really run a restaurant. Um, we had this one dinner where we had a course we were super proud of, and it went out, and several people said it was fantastic, and then one, a woman at one uh, table motions me over. She just, I just want you to know, this was a complete aberration. What on earth are you doing? She just, just decides to dress me down in front of everybody. Um, and I thought, boy, I'm glad I don't do this for a living. <laughs> it's actually really tough. So we've, Thomas Keller has come, Wolfgang Puck has come, t tons of other people, Chris Kimball from uh, America's uh, Test Kitchen ha has come for dinner. And we found that it's really interesting to try to learn uh, by cooking as well as by doing all the experiments that we do. We, we've learned a tremendous amount from these dinners about pacing, about what people like, about how you can delight people, how you can turn them off. So that's it. Uh, for, except for questions. So we have some time for some questions. <laughs> that was with a 308? the cross sections for the pots of food and how do you take the pictures with suspended gravity for the sandwiches? Um, so I, I have a whole section about how we describe this. The simple answer is we really cut things in half and we make a hell of a mess. Um, uh, so a, a lot of the stuff we simply cut uh, something in half and we, we deal with it. Um, we have a, a, a couple of pictures of a barbecue that's been cut in half. And people say, well, what keeps the coals from falling out? I say, oh, that would be Johnny. <laughs> um, you know, they fall out, and he's got tongs, and he puts them back, and they fall out again. And um, it, you know, We have a great picture of doing a pan saute, and a professional chef doing a saute has got the pan, and you kind of go like this in this motion where you roll the things up. And so we have to do it with half a pan. And people say, well, how do you do that? The answer is, it goes in the floor. <laughs> you put a tarp down, you pick it up, you do another one. Do you get it? Um, and a lot of it involves making a hell of a mess and making sure that uh, the, um, you get the right shot. Because our motto is, it only has to look good for a thousandth of a second. Um, for the suspending gravity shots, generally what we do is we have something propping them up, um, usually from behind. 
Um, a few times we've done it where we take things, we actually drop them. But uh, that, it's easier to space them. So for those grilled cheese sandwiches and stuff, they're each is a little platform behind. Um, when we've got a liquid that we're containing, we typically will take the, the, um, the pot that we've cut in half and we glue a piece of Pyrex to it. Then you take the picture. The great thing when you cut something in half is you have a second half left. So then you put that in the same position, you photograph that, and then you just copy the bits right from the edge. So it's very much like in Spider-Man, where Spider-Man flies through the air. Well, of course, that's really a stuntman, so it's supported by a wire. Then you digitally take the wire out, and magic, it flies. Um, so, uh, you know, the, some of the equipment is really hard to cut in half, and we've got a whole machine shop, though, so we, we kind of persevere and have done it. Also, some of it's really dangerous. Um, well, we discovered why people don't fry with a wok cut in half, for example. <laughs> um, one of our guys lost his eyebrows that way. Hi. Uh, how much of modernist cooking at home is new material, and how much is uh, distillation from the other book? Uh, well, distillation is covered in the first book, but no, that isn't what you meant. Um, uh, so at some level, it's all new. And it's all new because where there was a recipe or a technique, we did a bunch of work to adapt it to things you could get in a, a, a grocery store uh, uh, and equipment that you'd have at home. So uh, our roast chicken recipe is almost completely different, as an example. Um, uh, the carrot soup changed quite a bit. Uh, in the first version, if you really followed the original recipe totally, you needed a centrifuge and a bunch of other stuff. So, we, we've set, so every recipe is new. Um, maybe a third of them have a, a parallel in the first book, and that there was something there that, that there was some relationship to it. And probably two thirds, 60 percent, something like that, uh, is absolutely brand new. With so much experience in the science of food, what's your favorite emotional food memory? Hmm. Uh, well, I cooked, uh, when I was nine years old, I told mom I was going to cook Thanksgiving dinner. And I went and I did all the shopping myself. I wouldn't let mom in the kitchen. Uh, and that was a great memory because it actually sort of kind of worked. I mean, not as well as I would do today. But my favorite dish was one I made the next year when I decided to cook Thanksgiving dinner. And we had a dish that was truly modernist in spirit. And it was called Firecracker Surprise. <laughs> and uh, there was a, uh, we, we got one of those cloches, a bell that you put over. And my brother helped me with this. So I was 10, he was eight. Um, <laughs> he got to lift the bell off dramatically while I dropped a lit firecracker under the table. <laughs> It was definitely a surprise, but we nearly lost one of my maiden aunts, or my, mother, my, my mother's maiden aunt. Medela wasn't so cool with that. But, <laughs> but that was a modernist thing to do, to shock and surprise somebody. Hi. Can you tell us what your favorite meal is for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? So my favorite breakfast uh, is uh, scrambled eggs. Uh, that we make from a recipe in the book, but I'll tell you the essence of it right now. So, with scrambled eggs and omelets and things like that, you have this problem that the omelet or the egg will set too hard. Now, you can use temperature to adjust that a little bit, but it also helps if you add fat. And a traditional French thing to do would be to add a little bit of cream or, or some melted butter to, to whip in with the egg. But melted butter doesn't like egg. So, Next time you're cooking scrambled eggs or an omelet or something else, if you're making three eggs, use two whole eggs and one egg yolk. So throw one egg white away. Now, if you care about calories, you didn't make it any higher fat than the three eggs would have been. You actually lost a few calories by taking out the white. Not much fat, but, but a few calories. That changes the ratio, and it'll amaze you. It's got totally, it's much better texture, it's much yellower, now, you can go crazy and keep adding more yolks, um, and at some point it gets really orange, and then it, it, it's got a completely different texture. So I do that, and then I generally uh, cook it, because uh, I have a steam oven at home, um, I generally cook it to about 164 degrees. That's perfect scrambled egg texture for me. Um, <laughs> I mean, you asked. Uh, <laughs> uh, lunch, I don't think I have a single favorite 
uh, lunch. And for dinner, I love to eat all kinds of interesting food. You know, one of the key things about food is that we all love variety. And people say, well, is modernist cooking going to take over? No cooking's going to take over. In fact, today, in Boston or in Cambridge, either one, there's a greater variety of food now than ever before in history. And if we look 10 years from now, there's going to be even more. Now, for a while, we got that extra variety by importing foods. Hey, let's have Italian food. Hey, there's something called sushi. Um, and sushi was initially weird, you know, raw fish, eh. Um, now, sushi is in every strip mall in America, just about. Um, and the ones it isn't in, it'll be in. But the interesting thing is, as a planet, we are running out of stuff like that. I mean, people love to talk about all of the limits of, of Earth, and we're running out of lots of things. But it turns out we're running out of cool cuisine. Because <laughs> there's not 10 more great things like sushi. So sushi was developed by a whole set of people improving it, innovating, preserving what was best, but changing over a period of hundreds of years. So you don't make one of those overnight. And there aren't 10 more of them. So I don't know if there's Tibetan food uh, or Nepalese food in Cambridge. Probably there is. There's probably some place that doesn't have a recipe in Cambridge, or doesn't have a restaurant, excuse me. They will. But that alone isn't enough to satisfy our incredible, insatiable urge for variety. Uh, which is why modernism exists. That's why invention exists. That's why some of those things I showed you, using tomatoes, inventing corn, inventing ice cream, uh, all of those things were people creatively coming up with a new idea for cooking. We're going to keep doing that. And so my favorite lunch and dinner is eating in some really interesting um, place. It doesn't really matter whether it's uh, cheap or expensive or it's low tech or it's, uh, it's high tech. It's experiencing somebody else's vision of flavors and textures. Long-winded answer, sorry. So um, for your new book, I was wondering what your criterion are for uh, uh, what's a successful recipe? How did a recipe get into your book? So I'd love to go through lots of discussion of an analytical process and all these other things. But basically, I had to really like it. Um, uh, and we wanted to illustrate a bunch of basic concepts. Uh, so we had, so w with the, the new book, we said let's have, there's a chapter called Basics, and there we have basic stocks, um, dressing, salad dressings, and a, a bunch of things that are about, here's some really basic building blocks that every cook ought to learn how to do, that we think we know how to do maybe better, um, and more conveniently, and so forth. And there the, the goal isn't to say you must make exactly our stock, but teach you how to make a stock, teach you how to make a salad dressing, teach you how to do those things. Then we tried to have chapters, there's 23 chapters in the book, and they tried to cover not everything, but a whole bunch of things that we think would be interesting for home cooking. Um, so the chapter on chicken wings and s uh, snacks on a stick, well, that's because there's a whole lot of great cuisines that have created that. We thought we would honor that with this, and it's something that people really do eat. Um, uh, we did steak, pretty simple thing. Now, once you do steak, you say, okay, we got to throw in pork chops and a rack of lamb and a couple of other things that are all about cooking relatively tender meats quickly to make a steak-like thing. Uh, and we have a whole bunch of different techniques. Um, uh, one of my favorite ones in the steak technique um, is great for people that uh, have frozen food and they forget to defrost it because you cook the steak directly from frozen. It works spectacularly well. So you have this problem when you cook a steak that when you cook with high heat, you get a temperature gradient, and you get those bands of gray meat on two sides. Typically, those bands of gray meat are 25 to even 30 percent of the volume of the steak. So you spend a lot of money for steak, and if you want it medium rare, you have to put up with these two bands that are well done. So it turns out if you take a cast iron pan, um, a pan you, it takes a lot of heat. It doesn't have to be cast iron, but they're really cheap, and they take a lot of heat, and you can't break them. So you heat it up super hot with some high temperature oil in it. Take the steak out of the freezer, put it right in. And you sear it until it's really nice and, uh, and brown on both sides. And believe it or not, with a decent burner, you can sear it as brown as you want. It'll still be hard as a rock inside. Then you put it in an, your oven at 250 degrees, or wherever the lowest your oven will, will go. And you sort of check it periodically. It'll probably take an hour to two hours. Um, 
and it'll be perfect inside. Uh, and by just probing it with your, now, with, if you have sous vide equipment, you could also cook it sous vide, and that would be another whole thing. But if you don't have sous vide equipment, you can approximate all that. Plus, if you're a dork like me and you forget to take the steak out in time, hey, it's okay. <laughs> I don't have to let it defrost overnight. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's encouraging to see where physicists can go. Um, so I was wondering, what is like the most interesting non-obvious application of some physics principle, thermodynamics, mechanics that you've discovered in this whole process? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it all depends on, he, he clearly has, is a physicist because he said non-obvious. Um, <laughs> besides everything being spherical, that's another uh, physics speak thing. Um, it, probably the one that's, you could argue whether this is really interesting or not, but I'll, I'll tell you anyway. Um, uh, that has to do with something called the, the stall in barbecue. If you cook traditional southern barbecue that has a big hunk of meat, like brisket or pork shoulder or whole hogs, there's this phenomena that people noticed for eons ago, that the temperature will rise, and then it will stall, it'll stop rising for hours, then it'll go back up. And if you search on the internet, you'll find thousands of pages devoted to people arguing about what makes the barbecue stall. Well, damn it, we figured out what makes the barbecue stall. And here, here's the basic idea. People had lots of theories. And most of the theories were that you were making a chemical change in the meat. You were, particularly, you were taking collagen and turning it into gelatin. And so you were absorbing the energy in there. Doesn't work. It's a lot of energy. You got this big chunk of meat in, in hot uh, smoker or oven. And it's not, temperature isn't going up for four hours. That's a lot of energy. So something is cooling the hell out of it. There's only one thing it could possibly be, and that's water evaporation. Because when water evaporates into um, uh, steam or water vapor, uh, a, a, the degrees of freedom go way up thermodynamically. You have enormously more entropy. It costs a lot of energy to do that. Water is particularly uh, good with that because water uh, uh, has these funny hydrogen bonds. So here's an interesting thing. We'll go back, give me an excuse to play with liquid nitrogen. Um, this stuff is, uh, has a boiling point of 321 degrees below zero. Its molecular weight is actually similar to water. If water had the same properties, the water molecules had the same properties as the nitrogen molecules, water too would have a boiling, boiling point down there and life would not be possible. What makes water stick to itself so well that it's got a boiling point that's hundreds of degrees hotter is um, something called hydrogen bonds. Water molecules love to stick to each other. And that loving to stick to each other is hard to break. So huge amount of energy. So to prove all this, we took a brisket, we cut it in half, we wrapped one up so it couldn't evaporate. Uh, we had the other one uh, bare. We stuck them both full of uh, uh, temperature probes. And sure enough, there's no stall at all in the one that was covered, and a huge amount in this. Now, the part I love about this is one of the traditional techniques for dealing with a stall is to mop more sauce on. This does not work. <laughs> okay, this is like heating something up by running a garden hose on it. Okay, they actually cool it down, but because that wasn't realized. So I, it was certainly not obvious to everyone who was in that field for you know, 50 years that people have, have argued about this. You've had um, several very successful chefs come and eat your food. As you mentioned at the end, you had Thomas yeah. Keller. I was wondering if you could tell us what are a few of the reactions, both good, maybe not so good, that you've gotten to uh, modernist cuisine? Well, there's, in terms of good, um, people like the book. <laughs> they, they like the book and they like our food. Um, and it was important for us to cook for people like Thomas Keller because we didn't have any street cred. And uh, there was, maybe they didn't worry about it, but we worried that people thought, well, okay, they can make these cool pictures, but does their food actually taste good? So I think we convinced them the food tastes good. Um, after Thomas came, uh, he sent the head chef uh, and head pastry chef from every one of his restaurants for subsequent dinners. So maybe that was so he come come back and say, see what dorks they are? But, <laughs> but I'm thinking not because he wrote the preface to my new book. Um, so that was both very gratifying. 
Uh, but it also helps us you know, ground it in something that says, yeah, actually, aesthetically, this is something that, that, that's reasonable. In terms of negative reactions, uh, there's two kinds of negative reactions we have. Well, one set of negative reactions uh, is to the book, and most of those negative reactions uh, are from people that have never seen it. But it turns out never seeing something doesn't mean people won't judge it. Um, and in fact, there's a saying, don't judge a book by its cover. You know why that expression exists? Because people judge books by its cover. <laughs> now, of course, we have a nice cover. But, but all the same, uh, you know, when it was announced that the price was $625, it outraged people. Uh, I talked to this one person, who, a journalist, who said, no book is worth that. I said, well, now you made me mad. Because you might say my book is not worth that. Maybe my book isn't worth that. But if you say no book is worth that, you've tried to cheapen all of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And by the way, have you bought any textbooks recently? <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> head to some place that sells textbooks and buy the same weight as my book as my, my book and see what the hell it costs you. And they don't have cool pictures. <laughs> they don't have chromocentric inks or stochastic screening. Um, but it sort of offends people's sensibilities. Uh, another way it offends people's sensibilities is, uh, is that there is an aesthetic idea that somehow science is bad for cooking in some way. Um, I, I get, th this is like the question of what, what made you put science in the kitchen? Um, it, it, it's, uh, but it's often expressed more negatively as you're taking the soul out of cooking. I said, how so? Um, and people said, well, sous vide. Sous vide takes the soul out of cooking. I said, well, look, sous vide, at its essence, is about using a digital thermostat to accurately control temperature so I don't overcook the stuff. And it turns out that little, simple, trivial digital circuit is a way better thermostat than you or I will ever be. But why is it soulful for me to sit there being a thermostat? I mean, you could do it. You put a thermometer in there, and you have a little dial, and oh, shit, it's going up. I gotta turn it down. Up. <laughs> That's soulful? So I just don't get it. It's like, well, okay, well, they say, but, but the results are perfect every time. That's boring. I said, so it's soulful if you overcook it or undercook it. Uh, we ought to tell Thomas Keller and Alain Ducasse they're not soulful, because those guys are so damn good they never do. You know, you, you go through this whole set of things, and to me, there is, I, I understand why people say it, because they feel threatened that this is going to cheapen this thing that they, they honor and love. But to me, soulfulness, aesthetic expression, that's in how you combine flavors and textures and what you choose to serve. There's a huge element of that which is purely aesthetic. It's not about, you know, the thing that makes cooking soulful is not, well, that was it, you know, um, 131.2 degrees. No, that's not soulful, that's technology. And te if technology allows me to do it more conveniently and easier and cheaper and better, well, why not do it? Uh, but there are people who do that and then they try to, um, uh, they try to make a big controversy about it. Um, uh, there was a radio sh program that interviewed Alice Waters and then many months later, about one set of topics, not about my book, but, but then they interviewed me, then they cut it together to make it seem like Alice was arguing with me. <laughs> um, and that, you know, she was, they asked her about science and she was a little bit dismissive of science and some other, but in very general terms. So this, this airs actually in New York. Um, the next day, I get this call from Alice. She says, but I love the book. They didn't, <laughs> it's because the book, my book at some level is about loving food. And even if Alice Waters doesn't cook every recipe and doesn't use a centrifuge and uses other things, she loves food too. And it, showing people how cooking works, getting people in touch with cooking at some level, I think is a great thing. So yeah, we've had a bunch of negative reactions. Um, but you know, if, if you don't upset somebody, you probably didn't do anything very important. Um, you know, no one has run cartoons like those. <laughs> I, I showed her the Impressionist paintings. They have run things like that about Ferran and other modernists. Chefs, yeah. If you don't shake things up a bit, probably not going to get any. Uh, you, you didn't do anything worthwhile. Let's have one last question at the back. Um, where can I try your tasting menu? <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Can, where can you try your tasting menu? 
Well, so, you know, pop-up restaurants uh, have become all the rage. And uh, those dinners, like the, the one I showed, are kind of the next evolution beyond pop-up. Um, you can't make reservations because you have to be invited, and you can't pay because you're our guest. Um, I think it's that last part is going to limit its popularity. Uh, so uh, we've done them roughly once a month, but not clustered that way. We'll do, we'll do like two a week for, for a few weeks, and then we'll, we'll not do them. Uh, every now and then we'll cook an event some other place. Uh, Charlie Trotter uh, retired after 25 years, uh, actually. Uh, and so we cooked for the last dinner, the last big celebratory dinner there. Uh, so every now and then we do things like that. Uh, the best way to eat this kind of food is to find great inventive uh, chefs. Um, and there's many of them all over the place. There's many in Boston. Uh, Jason Bond at Bondier is very farm to table oriented, but he cooks with an eye towards technique. He's come out for, for one of these dinners. Um, Tony Maas at Craigie on Main. Um, Cleo, there's tons of restaurants in Boston that at one level or another are playing with some aspect of this modernist movement. And then uh, uh, around the world there's more. So mostly you gotta go to those guys, but I don't know, every now and then maybe we'll do a dinner. So you may not be able to get invited to the dinner, but you can get books signed at the back <laughs> after we give Nathan one more hand.